Well, praise the Lord. Oh, we're glad you're here. And if you're watching online, welcome to Victory. If you're watching on your mobile device, television, however you're tuning in, we're glad that you're here. And we believe the Word of God will make positive impact in your life if you will hear it and do it. Got to be a doer of the Word of God. It'll change everything. Well, I thought uh, it's kind of funny. So it says a woman arrived in the gates of heaven. While she was waiting for St. Peter to greet her, she peeked through the gates. She saw a beautiful banquet table sitting all around her were her parents and all the other people she had loved and who had died before. She, she saw them and she began calling greetings to, to her saying, Hello, how are you? We've been waiting for you. Good to see you. When St. Peter came by, the woman said to him, This is such a wonderful place. How do I get in? And he said, Well, all you have to do is spell one word. She said, Well, which word is it? He said, Love. So the woman correctly spelled love, and <clears throat> St. Peter welcomed her into heaven. About a year later, St. Peter came to the woman and asked her to watch the gates of heaven for him that day. While the woman was guarding the gates of heaven, her husband arrived. I'm surprised to see you, the woman said. How have you been? Oh, he said, I've been doing pretty well. Since you died, uh, her husband told her, he said, I married the beautiful young nurse who took care of you while you were ill. And then I won a multi-state lottery. I sold the little house you and I lived in, and I bought a huge mansion. And my wife and I have traveled all around the world, and we were on vacation in Cancun, and I went water skiing today, and I fell and I hit my head, and here I am. What a bummer. How do I get in? She said, you just have to spell one word. And he said, what word is it? She said, Czechoslovakia. <clears throat> okay. Uh, 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 uh. Women are nasty. I'll tell you, you got to watch it. All right, as always, I need you to have ears to hear. Do you have ears to hear? See, that's, that means your attitude, are you plugged in to where you're going to listen to what God is saying to you through his word? Amen, you can have ears to hear or not. Jesus always used that phrase, let him that have ears to hear, let him hear. Everybody say it out loud, I have ears to hear. All right, so we're going to pray right now. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for our time together tonight, to this morning. I thank you for speaking through my lips, putting your words in my, my mind and my mouth. And I pray for each person within the sound of my voice, those that are watching, those that are here today. And I pray that as I minister, you'll minister. You love every person here. You know their past, their present. You know their future. You know their hardships, their struggles, their trials. And you care about them. And I'm asking you that as I minister, you reach them, you help them, whatever they need to be in your will and to accomplish your will and purpose for their life. We thank you for it. We agree together in Jesus' name. And everybody who agreed said, Amen. Amen. So we started the series. We were talking about the greatest. And last week we talked about the greatest life. And today we're going to talk about the greatest church. It's very interesting. There's a lot of things about church. People don't even, some of them don't even know what really church is. And some of them think it's just a building. And then, um, <clears throat> so what does the Bible say about it? And really what makes a great church? So that's what we're going to be talking about. But we're going to start and use our foundation scriptures over here in Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 38 and 39. And it says this way, he does not, this is Jesus talking, he who does not take up his cross and follow me, cleave steadfastly to me, conforming wholly to my example. Everybody say Jesus example. To my example in living and if need be in dying also is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his lower life will lose it, the higher life. Whoever loses his lower life on my account will find it the higher life. Now, he, he's not just saying whoever dies on my account will find the higher life. He's talking about <clears throat> that there are really two paths that you can have in life. There's two roads that you can go on. There's what he calls the lower life, and then he calls it a higher life. This was the theme with Jesus. We see him talk about it in Matthew 7. He said it a little bit differently. He said, enter ye in at the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life and there are few who find it. And the, the word find here actually means there are few who obtain it. Well now, why would it be that way? Is it because it's a path that nobody knows, nobody can find it, it's, it's hidden, it's a mystery? That's really not it. The reason that so many people choose the wide gate to go in through and they miss the narrow gate which he calls a difficult way is because it's it's difficult and what makes it difficult is that in life every human being from the first pair Adam and Eve 
and it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. The first pair, Adam and Eve, from the very beginning, the thing that caused them to sin and bring sin and destruction into the human race was this lower life. They were tempted with it. Uh, 1 John 2 calls it the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And he, uh, Satan, through the serpent, showed her a tree, and it was beautiful to look at, and showed her the f fruit, and it was pleasant to the eye. And then he said, it'll make you like God. You'll be wise. And when she saw it was a tree to be desired, so it was these three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, and that's what caused them to sin. And that's something that every human being born on the planet, you're going to have to learn to deal with those things. And if you don't learn to overcome that, it'll keep you on the lower life and cause you to miss out on the higher life. Can I get an amen from you? In fact, you can be a Christian. And when I, when I say Christian, I don't mean, you know, just somebody joined church. I'm talking about you've been born again. Jesus said you got to be born again into the family of God. But you can be a born again Christian and still walk the lower life. Are you here? I mean, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. These were born again spirit-filled believers, tongue talkers, and yet he told them that they were carnal. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, notice what he said in verse 3. He said, for you are still unspiritual. What? Having the nature of the flesh under the control of ordinary impulses, for as long as there is among you envying and jealousy and wrangling and factions among you, are you not unspiritual and of the flesh? behaving yourselves, everybody say behaving yourselves, <laughs> behaving yourselves after a human standard and like mere, what kind of people? Unchanged men. So you can be saved and you can be unchanged. Are you still here? Because change is the life of a disciple. And you know, I, I was born again when I was, uh, you know, I was about six years old but I never really went to church, never grew any, so I was carnal, I was just like that, unchanged all the way through till I was about 20, and then at age 20, I made a rededication, we would call it, to the Lord, decided I'm gonna follow him. Shortly after that, I got married, and uh, I mean, I really got serious about God. God had something for me to do in my life, and I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and it began to, I mean, it was like all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. And what I mean, I mean, I had this nature of the flesh. I was selfish, full of pride. You know, unlike none of you here, just that was just me. I know nobody else like, and, 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 you know, I had sins and I had problems and I had all this baggage that I brought with me into Christianity. And I mean, it was like, you talk about, you talk about being torn to pieces. It was like, I, I wanted to do right. I wanted to serve God, but you, I still had fears and addictions and pride and sin and all of this junk, and, and so I was, I was living like an unchanged man, and so I started working hard to try to get, get this. Man, I, I, I know there's something better in life. And so I fasted a couple of days a week. I did that for a prolonged period of time, and I started studying my Bible, and it was like, you know, I mean, <clears throat> I, I just, my life became just this constant battle of trying to change and, and get rid of this lower life. And I mean, one of the things that helped me, I mean, I was very dedicated and consecrated, but it, it doesn't happen overnight. Are you here? How many of you know we still have stuff to deal with? And even though I was working at it, I mean, God is my witness. I was working at trying to change and, and become the man I should be. But I mean, I'd still lose my temper and, and say ugly things. And I, I mean, it was terrible. And finally, I mean, one, one just, just kind of came to a head. It was a catalyst and it just, so I'm, ranting and raving about something, you know, as spiritual as I was. And so I'm ranting and raving at my wife, and she started crying. And uh, she said, listen, she said this. She said, all of this fasting and praying that you do, all of this Bible reading, you've become obsessed with the Bible, you read the Bible all the time, I'm for it, you go to church all the time, you're praying, you're fasting, you're doing all this. If this, is what, if this is what it is, if this is what it does, I don't want that. 
I mean, it was like, true. It's like a ton of bricks hit me. And I thought, well, that, that's absolutely true. I've got, to, I've got to get through this lower life. I have, got to, I have got to learn to be spiritual and to walk in the God kind of love and to control my flesh. And we're all in this fight to a one degree or another. Can I get an amen from you? And so, so we, we talked about that, living this kind of a life. And today we're going to talk about the greatest church. And so I'm just going to start here. This is very interesting. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Do you not discern and understand that you, the whole church at Corinth, or you could say Decatur or Wise County, are God's temple, his sanctuary, and that God's spirit has his permanent dwelling in you to be at home in you collectively as a church and also individually? If anyone does hurt to God's temple or corrupts it with false doctrines or destroys it, God will do hurt to him and bring him to the corruption of death and destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, Notice these next three words. Everybody say sacred to him. Did, did you know that the church, which he calls the temple of God, it is sacred to him. It is sacred. It's not some kind of joke. It's not an afterthought. It is sacred to him. And that temple, you, the believing church, and its individual believers are, notice, well, it says, for you, the believing church and its individual believers are sacred to him. Th that's what we are. I mean, so the church is something. There are two things that, that God instituted, marriage, the family. Well, three things, marriage, the family, and the church. And, and Jesus, Jesus loves the church. God loves the church, and, and not only collectively, but individually, You've been born into the family of God. You're a child of God, if indeed you have been born again. And, and he loves you. You are sacred to him. Jesus compared this relationship like a bridegroom and a bride. And, and, and the bridegroom, he loves his bride. He wants to be with his bride. He loves her. He cares about her. He'd give his life for her. He did. So the church is holy and it's sacred to God God loves the church, and so we want to be, as individuals, we want to be a great church as, as a collective individual. I mean, as collectively, as a, as a church body, we want to be a great church. So, so I'm just going to give you three things. I could do a lot of things, but for the sake of time, I just want to give you three things that are very important to God in relation to the church. And the first one is this, great churches care about the chair. You care about the chair. You know, sometimes we come into Christianity and over a period of time, all of our friends are Christians and that's wonderful and it's great and it should be that way and we have connect groups we go to and all of our friends are there and we have church services we go to and they're there and our, our world kind of, we kind of back out of the world of sinners and it's like a lot of times we forget all about them. But notice what Jesus said about that. In fact, here in John chapter 4, verse 35, he says, Say not ye there are yet four months, and then comes harvest. I say to you, lift up your eyes. Look at the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Everybody say, lift up your eyes. Now, is that something you do, or is that something God does? Who's he telling to lift up their eyes? Well, if he tells you to lift up your eyes and look, that means he wants you to, to look at the harvest, the people you work with. They, uh, do you know if they're Christian? Are they Christian? Are they not Christian? People you go to school with, your neighbors. Do you, do you ever look? Do you ever think about their eternal destiny? Do you, do you care about the people that are around you? Does it ever even enter your mind? These people may not be in the family of God. They may be separated from God for eternity. Do you care about the chair? Do you care 
in other words, about getting them into the kingdom of God where they can grow and they can learn and they can have the life God wants them to have. And most of all, eternal life. It's true. We need to grow in the fruit of the Spirit that identifies us as disciples. Absolutely. We need to have good fruit and people can be around us and say, man, these people are different. I mean, they got love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, self-control. They can say, what, what, what is that fruit? Oh, they're, they're followers of Jesus. We need that, no doubt. We, we need to be the light of the world. We need to be people who the Bible says are zealous of good works. We need all of those things. But the very first step is salvation. People need to know God. They got to be born into the family of God. And, and sometimes we're around them, you know, and we, we very rarely lift up our eyes and look and start wondering about these people. Are they saved? Do they know God? Have you asked them? Do you care? You know, this, this last couple of weeks, I guess, been about two weeks, we had guys working at our house and uh, great, they were doing some rock work inside and helping with the fireplace, doing some remodeling, so on and so forth. And they were all Hispanic and I couldn't really talk to them much, you know. Uh, there was a guy there who could communicate with them a little bit. I, I mean, I couldn't, but I started thinking about these guys and I thought, I sure, I sure would like, I mean, here they are around me and I, I sure would want them to be in the kingdom of God. And so I prayed for them, and I was just thinking about them. And I, you know, at our bookstore, we have books in Spanish. And so I made a special effort to get some, some books in Spanish about the new birth, what it means to be born again, because a lot of them, if they went to any kind of church or anything, it was a religious experience, and they thought you were saved just from, you know, doing some Hail Marys and lighting some candles. And Hey, that won't save you. That won't save you. Jesus said you got to be born again. You have to receive Christ. You have to, eternal life is through Jesus Christ. It's not through religions. There's not a bunch of different ways you can get to God. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. And there's a whole lot of people that they don't know. Do you care? about the chair you ever think about it have you lifted up your eyes what about who you work with what about who you're around the people you work out with the people at ball games the people who are friends with your kids what do you care you know 1 Timothy 1.15 says this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners Paul said and I am chief why did Jesus Christ come into the world to do what? Well, I mean, that included all of us, didn't it? Were you, were you a sinner that got saved? Yeah, because we've all sinned and we've all missed it. But Jesus came to save people. John 3, 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. As Christians, we need to lift up our eyes, look on the fields, think about it. We're supposed to be uh, compelling. In Luke 14, 23, the Lord said unto his servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come into my house that it might be filled. Compel means be forceful or irresistible. It's not just supposed to be something you never think about. You never give it a, a, you know, it never pops into your mind. You're just busy living your life. You know you're going to heaven. You got a good life. Things are all right. If you die, you're going to heaven. But what about, what about the others? Do, do we care? Do we ever think about it enough to when there's a door open, when there's a little opportunity, do we ever even witness? You don't have to know a bunch of scriptures. You can just tell them what God has done for you or salt the oats a little bit about how much God loves them. And I'm, have you ever just told somebody, I, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. Do you care about the chair? Everybody said out loud, care about the chair. He tells us to be compelling. And then Jesus said that we're supposed to be fishers of men. 
He said, I'll make you fishers of men. You know, fishermen, they use lures. They use lures. They're trying to lure the fish. Are you here? Well, if, if we're fishermen, then that means we have to have some kind of lures. Some kind of something. See, culture changes, everything changes, but we have to have some kind of lures. Under the age of about 34, the percentage of people that are Christians is so low, it's astounding. And you get down into now the one, the latest generation, those about 20 and down, and it's mind-boggling how few of them are real Christians and give any, care anything at all about Christianity. They're busy with this. They've been told all kinds of lies. They think all kinds of crazy things. They don't even know that God created a male and female. They don't know. They don't know. So, so how can we be compelling? How can we have a way to lure them in? Well, we, we, have to have some, we have to have some things that they like. Now this morning we sang some hymns. Most of the time we don't sing many hymns here. We sing more of a, uh, sometimes we have rap songs going on. We have a newer modern type of music. We have lights up here. All of that stuff is not for us older generation that's already saved. I don't even know the words to our songs. And I'm the pastor. I just stand up here and lip sync and fake it. Now, I, I enjoyed the songs, but I mean, I like Southern gospel music. And I like some of the older hymns, but we have to remember, we're supposed to be looking at the fields. How can we reach unchained uh, people who are unsaved? How can we reach the next younger generation where when they come in, they feel comfortable, and it's not like stepping back in time a hundred years. Hey, my grandmother was born in 1889. When I went to her house, I'd drink water out of a tin cup. True. I still drink water, but the containers change. The package is different. We're still going to stay with the truth. We still got the water. Jesus is the only way. We're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. We trust and our faith is in him and what he's done for us. We're going to keep the same message. Amen. But we got to change the package a little bit. Are you here? If you don't change the package, what's happening? Church is shut down all the time. My son's over in Dallas at huge facility. This church that he's at, their facility is twice the size of, of our building and our school and all of our, we have 100,000 square foot. This building's got to be 200,000 square foot. It's incredible. And at one time, a thriving big church, and it just kept dwindling down, dwindling down until they couldn't even pay their electricity bill and pay their insurance. And they had to give the whole thing away to another church that's reaching younger people. Are you here? So we have to think about looking at the fields and are we reaching them? Are we reaching? Are we looking at the fields? Are we looking at the harvest that's out there? You got to care about the chair. Can I get an amen from you? Everything, everything begins to change. You know, Ford and General Motors, they change the look of their cars every three or four years, don't they? Well, I mean, your car might not be wore out, but you see a new one and you think, hey, I like that. Uh, businesses redo their, their, their facilities. They buy new furniture. They repaint. They modernize every few years. They change the furniture. Uh, women. They change their hairstyle. I mean, in one month, I think I've got a whole new set of visitors, and it's just different people's hair. <laughs> they, they, they have, Dondra, where is she in here? She, she has fingernails. She gets her fingernails changed. She came in with fingernails that long the other. They're illegal in three states as a deadly weapon. <laughs> Big old purple claw sticking out there. I thought, 
Man, you could cut somebody's throat with that. You have to learn to adapt. You got to learn to. You got to learn to change. I mean, some of them get Botox. Now, don't get mad. I mean, get Botox. And I mean, they look like the Joker. They can. <laughs> They've done so much. But at least they look happy all the time. I mean. <laughs> and now some of them get Botox in their buttocks. <laughs> Whoa! Who is that? <laughs> we have to learn to. To, to reach the next generation, we have to learn to think about the ones that are out there. Do you care about the chair? Everybody say, care about the chair. Second thing is this. Great churches care about one another. Hebrews chapter 10, notice what it says here in verse 24. Let us consider and give attentive, continuous care to watching over who? one another, studying how we may stir up, stimulate, and incite to love and helpful deeds and noble activities, not forsaking or neglecting to assemble together as believers, as is the habit of some people, but admonishing and warning and urging and encouraging one another and all the more faithfully as you see the day approaching. We're supposed to be warning and encouraging and admonishing one another. I mean, to, to provoke them. The word provoke here means to spur or agitate. I mean, we got a lot of horsemen in our church, and them spurs, it'll agitate, it'll get a horse moving. We're supposed to think about others. How can you inspire them? Well, one thing is your example. Does it matter to you? If everybody just followed your example in living and in your dedication to Jesus Christ and your dedication to the house of God, if everybody followed your example, I mean, would it be good or bad? You're not just, it's not just about you. It may be a grandchild watching you and your example. It may be a child watching you and your example and seeing, I mean, you can't, you can't con your kids. They'll see if that's really, if that's really what's important to you. He says we need to provoke one another to love and to good works and, and help people not, not drift away from the truth and get out of the, the house of God in the kingdom of God. You got to care about one another. Hebrews chapter 3, notice what it says here in verse 12 and 13. It says, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you. This is, he's writing to Brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. You know, some people, they'll start departing from the living God. They, they, they've been on the right path, and then they'll, get, they'll start getting off of, the, off, off of the right path onto the wrong path. They start departing. Jesus talked about it in Mark 4. He said there's the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things, and they enter in, and, and it, it causes people to stop bearing fruit anymore. So we try to encourage them, exhort them, so they won't be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Can I get an amen from you? Hebrews 3, I like this. Hebrews 3, verse 12 and 13. I'm going to read another translation. Well, this is 12 through 14, the contemporary English Bible. And it says it this way. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that none of you have an evil, unfaithful heart that abandons the living God. Instead, encourage each other every day, as long as it's called today, so that none of you become insensitive to God because of sin's deception. We are partners with Christ, but only if we hold on to the confidence we had in the beginning until the end. What? I mean, you got to hold on to your faith in Jesus Christ. You got to determine, I, I'm going to live my life and follow him and hold on and hang on and I'm not changing what I believe about Jesus. Amen. Are you here? And, and that's, that's part of us helping to encourage one another and, and let them know, hey, follow my example. I'll pick you up. Hey, man, I'm praying for you. There's something going on I can pray with you about. Encourage one another. Galatians chapter 6, this is interesting. It says, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. 
and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. And then the next, and it says, if you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourselves. You're not that important. I mean, we should be thinking about, the, you know, what happens in, in church world, a lot of times we eat our own. And if somebody messes up and, and they get in sin and then we, you know, we got the hotline and everybody's calling, I just wanted you to pray for so-and-so. Did you hear what happened? And really we're using prayer as an excuse to be a gossip. I'm getting real pastoral this morning. No, we're not supposed to be gossips. If somebody messes up, you better consider, the King James says, you consider yourself lest you also be tempted. There ain't anybody in here or anybody who's ever walked except Jesus, and he was tempted. Jesus was tempted without sin, but we can all miss it and we can all make mistakes, and when you see a brother or sister who's missed it and messed up, your job is not to gossip. Your job is to pray for them, try to encourage them, try to point them in the right path. Can I get an amen? We're supposed to care about one another. We care about the chair. We care about the lost. But we care about one another. Do you see somebody drifting away? Somebody getting on the wrong path? Pray for them. Care about them. Give them a call. Send them a note. Care about one another. The last thing is, great churches are strong spiritually. You know, Jesus cared so much about the church when he ascended on high. Notice what it says in Ephesians 4. Here's Ephesians 4. It's talking about Jesus Christ. It says, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. It says, for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. In other words, my job is to perfect or mature you to do the work of the ministry. I'm not doing the work of the ministry. You do the work of the ministry. For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect or a mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and we be not henceforth, no more children, one translation says, don't be an infant, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up. Everybody say, grow up. Grow up into him, which is the head, even Christ. We're supposed to grow up. Great churches are not just entertainment centers. I mean, hey, look, there's guys a lot sharper than me and they have people working for them and they're in the business realm and they, they run it as a business and they say this, let me just tell you, all right, you have to have 200, you have to have 200 butts in the seat on Sunday for any congregation to be able to even support itself a little bit. So we're gonna go, we're gonna start a campus church. We have to have 200, we have to be able to get 200. And then as the church gets bigger and it expands, you got all the expenses. They say, all right, we got to have so many people in the seats. And so we can't speak the truth too much because we might offend somebody. Oh. So I know, I, I go to church conferences. So you got to quit using so much Bible. You can use one or two scriptures and then tell some good entertaining stories. People like to be entertained. They'll come hear that. They'll get their rear in the seat, man. Everything will be great. No. That's not what Jesus told us to do. In the Great Commission, in Matthew chapter 28, uh, Jesus talked about what are, we, what are we supposed to be doing? He said, go into all the world. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe what I, all the things I commanded. You gotta be taught something. If you're gonna grow spiritually, Jesus said, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You gotta have some word getting in you. 
It'll build you up. It'll set you free. The truth will set you free from your addictions and your sin and your bondage and your lying and your bad temper. The truth will lift you up and bring you onto another path of life that God has for you, a greater life, a higher life, and a blessed life. Hallelujah. What you got to hear, you got to hear the word. But I tell you, when you start preaching the word, people that have ears to hear, you know, you can take a baby out pretty easy. They can't fight. They can barely walk. But you start growing up, you start getting some spiritual muscles, some spiritual wisdom. You, you start learning how to put on the full armor of God. You get a grown man out here spiritually, and he's got on his full armor, and he's got a weapon He's a force to be reckoned with, naturally and spiritually. That's why you got to hear the word of God. You got to correct. There are things in your life need to be corrected. There are things in my life need to be corrected. And that's what the word of God is for, to correct us and keep us on the right path. Can I get an amen? And we're not supposed to be a church that's just a community of believers, but we stay in the babyhood state of Christianity. And when the crisis of life comes, the only thing we can offer you is sympathy. Nope. We're going to tell you how to put on the armor of God, how to draw, draw out that sword of the Spirit, how to take up that shield of faith, how to resist the devil so he'll flee from you. How to put on that breastplate of righteousness, knowing that you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. We want to teach you how to, how to operate in the authority that Jesus Christ gave you as a believer. He gave you the right to use his name. Amen. Tell you what, you start learning some of that. How to get your prayers answered. You start learning some of that. You start growing up. You start impacting. Your circle of impact gets bigger and bigger and bigger and people see the life change that you've had. So great churches, they still teach the truth and they always will and they're taught how to apply it in life. And guess what? That's you. Individually, individually, and corporately, we want to be a great church that accomplishes the will of God, stand before Jesus, and him say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Can I get an amen from you? We need to know, we need to get this in our heart, that he's in us, and he's for us, and he's with us. Whatever your situation in life is, sometimes all the faith you can say is, I know God is with me and God is for me and he's in me and I'm going to get through this trial and I'm going to overcome this because I have faith in God and I trust in him and in his word. First John 4, 4, last scripture, says you are of God, little children. One translation, you're born of God little children, and have overcome them. Have overcome who? Satan, all of his cohorts, all demons and evil spirits. You have overcome them. How come? For greater is he that's in you. Greater is he that's in you. We, we read it at the beginning. You're the temple of God, individually and corporately. God lives in you. Greater is he that is in you than any test, than any trial, than any circumstance, Greater is he that's in you. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Why? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Can I get an amen from you? All right, stand up on your feet. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Lift your hands and praise the Lord just for a minute. Father, we just want to praise you and worship you.
We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. You are a great and a mighty God. You are a great Savior. You are our Lord and our Redeemer, and we give you glory and praise and honor. Blessed be your wonderful holy name. Everybody say this out loud. I am part of God's great church. I care about the chair. I care about others, and I am strong spiritually, and I'm getting stronger every day. I know greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I am part of God's great church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give the Lord some praise for that. Hallelujah. All right, well, I love you guys. Now, uh, we got all of these shows coming up, Millie Monka, and uh, it gives you a chance to invite somebody, get them in the house of the Lord. Maybe that's their first step if they don't go to church. So I love you, care about the chair, be a blessing to others, and remember, you are strong in the Lord. I love you, God bless you, and consider yourself this message.